Gideon Ministry International is a wonderful ministry. I might ask those of us uh, that are part of our congregation, whether you're auxiliary, regular attenders, or friends of Gideon's, would you stand up? And these are the names, some of them in early service. Would you stand right now? Marie, Dave, Linda, Marie. And uh, I know there's, there's some others. Uh, so thank you guys for serving. You can be seated. In the foyer over here, there's a table. And uh, Gideon's distribute Bibles, uh, as you know, in a lot of public places, uh, hotels, different places. There are many, many stories of people finding Christ because they, in a time of need, were able to put their hands on a Bible and the power of the Word spoke into their life. If you're interested in being a part of the Gideon, stop by the table, go by and meet them, and greet them. Uh, and uh, in a moment, we're going to do uh, a dollar blessing, a generous giving to help them, uh, the Gideon ministry, to be able to get the Bibles, to pass them out. And if ever you have someone that passes, you can also give Bibles and send a card saying that in their memory, instead of flowers, you gave a living word. Uh, there's other opportunities at different occasions that you can do such a thing. And um, I also just, just kind of, I want to mention that um, uh, there's also this new program they have called Friends of Gideons, where you don't have to, you're not a member, but you're a friend of Gideons. You sign up for that, and the Gideons will provide you with Bibles that you can have in case you have a desire to have some on hand, keep them in your car, as God would lead you to give out the word yourself. You're, you're kind of a friend of a Gideon and giving out the word that way. So stop by the table. It's right out this way in the foyer, and at least say hello, and if you're interested, ask the questions, get involved. We're going to have, give you opportunity to give. You just, if you got a dollar, or ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever you want to give, the to help buy Bibles, so if the people that could help me serve would come down and, and just pass those down each the, the aisle. Uh, I think we need someone. We got people in this aisle over here. Comes Mike, come on down. So, uh, so as you do that, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, God bless all of you. It's a joy to be one of your pastors. And uh, today we begin a series on uh, Thanksgiving. The Thankful 30, okay, thankful 30. This came when Amy Lures posted something on Facebook, and I saw that, and the Holy Spirit pricked my heart and went, 30 days, you can start a new habit. And she had had a goal of watching what she has to say. And uh, I thought, wouldn't it be good for all of us to guard our words for 30 days? Nothing neg negative, no hate, no critical, uh, no cynical, no hurtful words, no uh, uh, gossip words, uh, um, no uh, attacking words, no mean words. Uh, instead, words of love, words of encouragement, words of building up, words of, uh, of uh, hope, words of, uh, of uh, uh, you get the idea, positive, positive, no, no, eh. sweet words, not bitter words. You all got it? All right, so what happens when you hear someone go off uh, on those words? What happens? You say, thankful 30. Just to remind them, yeah. November one was Thursday, that started it. November two was Friday, and I didn't mess up any Thursday and Friday, but Saturday in the missions board meeting, I went off about something, and, and because I'm mindful, it caught me. I stopped and went, ooh, that wasn't good, and they go, nope, it wasn't. And so uh, I think they, had, they were glad to say that. And so just, just let's do our very best. To, uh, to be prayerful, be filled up with God's Word, and pray, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that our words, because words do matter. You know, God created the world by speaking. Words matter. I want you to listen to me. Words that you speak matter. Words that you write out and give to others matter. And words that you put online matter. They're, in, they're significant. Now, Tuesday's the vote. So what can you do? If you're not a member to the New Hope Facebook members page, go and sign up because we post prayer requests, we, we post funeral notices, we post job listings, we post encouraging words, we promote, promote things and remind people of things that are happening. It's a good thing to do. I would urge anyone with a Facebook page, be a member of the New Hope Facebook, New Hope Facebook members page, okay? And you request that, and they'll put you on there. And on there, I posted some things as far as how to look at this uh, election. Number one is vote. Faith is dead without works. You can pray, but if you don't vote, then you're not putting action behind your heart. And pray that God would intervene in the election and that his will be done, and then pray that all people will respect the democratic process and receive whatever took place, whether you like it or not, and that continue to pray, as the Bible says, for our leaders and for our nation, 
and let's pray that others are civil and let's pray that God would protect people if people are upset, they don't have God's heart, they get on the streets and they riot or whatever because they're angry at the election. Uh, I, I, that, uh, that's not good. And you know, one of the things that people a lot of times will do, will, they will vote their pocketbook and not their heart from God. You need to pray and ask, I say, well, what, who would I vote for? I don't really know. You can go online, guys. It's easy to find. You can Google, and you can get every angle and every opinion so you can see all sides of it on every candidate. So it's not my job to help you know who to vote for. It's my job to say pray, investigate, and vote, and vote what's heart, God's heart. Are you all okay with that? All right. all right. How many already voted? How many are going to vote Tuesday? How many can't vote Tuesday, but you wish you could for some reason? You can't vote. You can't vote. How old are you? 12? I think you can vote it. And in America, I mean, <laughs> I think it works. Here's one thing you might not know. On any day before the election, like Monday, if it's better for you, you can go to the Polk County election office downtown and you can vote tomorrow. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, the early polls. Those are closed. But you can go to the Polk County election office tomorrow and vote. Uh, you fill out a thing, they tell you, uh, you find, they get your address, and then they give you the ballot that goes with the pertinent elections in your place, so you can go on Monday and vote. So no excuses, everybody vote. Well, first off, I want to ask you to forgive me if I've hurt you. I'm very convicted by this message, and I'm going to do my best to change my way. I think I've made some excuses, but in looking and studying and praying and examining, I think that I'm more convicted now than I ever have been about being careful with every word we speak. Uh, there's been times I've teased people, and I'm, and I, I'm just not going to do that anymore in any sort of a way like that might make them feel bad, because I want my sensitivity to be Holy Spirit driven. Like I might, I can tease myself about my hairdo um, because it's it's really rain friendly, and um, and that's okay. Uh, there's been times I've teased my wife and someone said something, don't, don't do that. That's not nice. And that was actually just this past week or so. And like, but I'm teasing. She laughs too. Yeah, but that's not nice. And so one of the things that I'm going is, okay, so is there something in my heart that I'm not realizing to make me tease like that? So, because there's actually a verse that talks about you say it and then you just go, oh, I'm just joking. Right? But it still hurts. Like I did, I did say to her the other day, Susan, I, I was truly teasing, I believe, I hope I was. And, uh, but I did say to her, because it's a busy season, my, wife, my daughter's getting married in July, I said, Susan, I said, be careful driving, because she's not a real good driver. It's not, nothing to put her down on, but, you know, and I'm, and I'm, double, I'm double bad. Uh, I'm worse than that. So if you want to get right with God, I'll give you a ride. I guarantee it'll help you. <laughs> and... Um, and so I said to her, I said, Susan, I said, I said, we got a wedding to pay for. I don't have the money for a funeral right now, and I don't have the time to go. So please don't kill yourself driving. She, she laughed, uh, but uh, Susan, I really was, I believe, I'm not positive, but I really was uh, 100% uh, only joking around. But uh, I, I, think, I think the real thing is, is what's in the heart, because humor is okay, but sometimes our humor comes out and there's a little edge to it where there's just a little enough truth that that we tease and it's kind of like a jab. And then you get jabbed, you push back, you fight back, you, you, you know, react. People could do that out of jealousy or out of hurt or out of putting you in your place or just out of, you know, maybe they don't mean it, but they just want to be the center of attention or they just want to like get a laugh or whatever. And, and sometimes those things aren't. So God help me. Uh, that. And one of the things I, I want to tell you, just listen carefully, and this is something worth videoing. Uh, if you want to video these words right now, get your phone out and get your video going or take notes on it. But I want you to know that words are costly. Words cost you something. And they can cost you like really big time. You, once they're spoken, they're out there and they can cut, they can kill, they can destroy, they can defeat. They're very costly, but words also can be an investment. Words have the power of life and the power of death. They can be an investment. The second thing that I want you to remember is that words hurt. It's not true that sticks and stones can break my bones, though they can, and words will never hurt me. They do. They hurt. Words matter. But listen to this. Words also heal. Words are good. Words are meant to use 
to heal and to invest in others and to exhort and encourage and speak uh, confidence and faith and, you know, help people. But the, and the last thing is hurtful words last and go on and on. People take that hurt and they live with it and they mull it and it hits their heart. And one of the things you have to do, you have to forgive people for hurtful things have said. If you don't, you're hurting yourself. Those words live on. But also, hurtful words last, but so do good words. Good words last too, like prayers. When you pray them, they continue to be like incense up into the nostrils of God, even after the person that prayed it, that grandmother that prayed for their grandchildren, 20, 30 years after they're gone, those words are still before God. It's almost like you got these, you know, a word is building up a monument, like a prayer, or like speaking a word, and you put in a stake in the ground, and you pray to God, and God comes out in the morning, and He, he goes like this, and there's a prayer monument, and there's another one, and He's walking around your prayers and to where it's dif- difficult for God to even get to the newspaper to see what's going on. That's humor. And, um, and, so, and so he goes, hey, uh, does somebody go uh, answer that prayer? Somebody go minister to that person. Someone go witness that person to get saved because I'm tired of these, these things in my way, right? Now, that's, that's totally humor, but get what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you pray, it's like a rock monument. It is stuck in the ground, and God's hearing it, and He keeps hearing it. It lasts, and it lasts. Good words last. Prayers last. The words that you build someone up with, the confidence that you give, it lasts, and it matters. Remember, words are important. In fact, Proverbs 18, 21, it's not on the screen, but it's one you need to write down. The tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. It, let me tell you something. If I didn't see that in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. I mean, literally, the words have power of life and power of death. Now, someone sent me an email, and this is a written email, and they're words of life, of exhortation, of, of direction to speak into your heart. And I don't know if they knew it was a prophetic word, but it was, and it was put in an email to me. And I'm going to give you, in my words, uh, because it was given to me in broken sentences. But here's, I believe it is for us and for this nation and for this church and for me. That we should be in reverence to God and have awe, like the awesome God, and deep respect and honor for God. We declare Jesus as a friend who sticks closer than a brother, but have we lost sight of and neglected the Jesus that John saw from the island of Patmos, where it says that Jesus, his eyes were like flames of fire and the voice like thunderous waters. This friend, Jesus, this friend of, that of God is to us, whose presence is so powerful that it left Isaiah and John with no mortal strength as they fell down before the presence and the holiness of God. Does anyone anymore know what it means to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness? Holiness, like judgment, words our modern culture and society do not want to even mention, even in church, much less out in society. And without holiness, the Bible says, no man will see the Lord. What does it mean to live holy? Holy matrimony, separate from all others, devoted to one. Holy men of God, separate from men of this world and the love of this world. Not physically, but separate through our words, through our thoughts, and through our actions. God is not a genie in a bottle that comes out to meet all of our needs at our little whim and prayer, but gets no attention or affection until the next crisis. Then he We pop the bottle, open up the genie, and out comes Jesus. He's Almighty God, deserving of our lives that we bow down before Him. And so with that, take seriously this message. And I hope that it pierces your heart so deeply that you don't excuse the little moments when you pop off, you say things. Our words do matter. And I'm I'm convicted. The title of the message is The Fruit of Our Lips. Paul, the first word out of fruit of our lips is fruit. Paul prayed 
in Philippians 1.11 because we understand that Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. In other words, we understand that what we actually do with our faith and how we talk and how we act and our life needs to reflect the change that it's real, that who we are and what we think, how we feel, the way we view things is coming from God's heart that has changed us. So fruit, we understand, is the result of our faith, how we live, how we speak. And Paul is actually praying a prayer in Philippians 1 for the church at Philippi. And Paul says, when he prays for the believers there, he says that he, we would be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Notice the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. There are too many in America, there's too many churches, and it seems like that we have a, a form of religion like like, like Paul wrote to Timothy saying in the last days it would happen, have a form of religion but denying the power of God. What is the power of God? It's the Holy Spirit. Now you might be witnesses when the Spirit fills your heart and gives you power to be witnesses when the Spirit is upon you. And so many times we are so weak. We're weak because we have come to a theology and a belief system and it's void of true conversion. By grace are you saved through faith. But let me tell you something, Ephesians 2.8. But let me tell you something. Without repentance, grace doesn't come. Until you say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Like when Isaiah saw the holiness and the train filled the temple and the glory of God was everywhere. Until you come to face to face where you say, God, I see my heart as Jeremiah has prophesied and said the man's heart is desperately wicked and I see my heart and there's nothing good in man, only God, and I need you there to change my heart. When I receive Christ, I pray, God, Jesus, come into my heart. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Why is he come into your heart? heart for to change your heart you see it's it's a conversion it's a changing and when we when we have Jesus come into our heart all of a sudden we see life differently we see through the eyes of God open my eyes that I might see open my ears that I might hear we hear what God thinks about everything we feel our emotions are changed our heart is we feeling what God was feeling and what God feels about people around us in the world around us. Do you, you hear what I'm saying? Like for instance, what do you think the word says about abortion? It says that life is, begins at conception. It says that God knew us in our mother's womb. It's an important thing, isn't it? It's not what I think. It's what God thinks. My opinion is my opinion. But if it doesn't agree with God's opinion, guess whose opinion is wrong? And guess where the opinion is written? Right here. These are words, the Bible declares, words of life, words of hope. To believe this word. And so it's very important that we understand that we need God to do something deep in our heart. And what, you, what I want you to listen to without me reading the scripture, and I'll show it to you in a minute, is that your heart is like a tree, all right? And everything that you look at and everything you listen to and everything you take in, conversations all around you, you're putting seed and fertilizer and soil to grow a certain kind of tree. And in the, when Jesus is talking about a tree and its fruit, he's saying the tree is the heart. And guess what? I had some bushes growing there that weren't too good. They were little wild seeds, right? And some of you need to cut down some trees in your life today. You need to cut down some trees of the, the words you speak. You need to cut down some trees of the way you look at things and your attitudes and, and, and whatever it might be. You need to cut down some trees and clean up so that you would have God's tree, God's spirit tree, God's fruit tree, and feed that tree with the word and through prayer and through meditation. We feed our tree with so many secular things and conversations and, well, I think, and I think this, and I think that. And, and it's what does God have to say? So my, my title of the message came from Hebrews 13, 15. 
and it, the fruit of our lips. And it says there in the King James, by him, meaning Jesus, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Now remember the Hebrew letter, the writer was writing to the Jews, the Hebrew children. And so they, they were the ones of the systems of sacrifices. And so he's saying, let your sacrifice of praise be to God continually. And then he clarifies what he's talking about. And he says, that is to clarify the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But here's the deal, that fruit of our lips is a word in the original language that can be translated different ways. And basically it's talking about the finest animal that you can offer if you have the money to offer the finest animal as a sacrifice. In other words, it's saying that the fruit of your lips, in other words, offer your best to God. That you bring your best to God. That's what God wants as your sacrifice to offer your life, to offer your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your energy, your time, your treasure, to offer all of you to God, that it would bring glory and give thanks to God. And so uh, we ask the question, the question begs, and by the way, if, you know, in, in the system then with, with animal sacrifices, the poor their best could be a pigeon. So they were allowed to, to bring a pigeon to sacrifice, right? Depending on your class and where, you know, your amount, uh, amount of uh, funds you had to be able to bring your sacrifice to God. Because after all, it's always been with God the heart, not the actual measure. So, you know, it's, a, it's not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. Or let's look, put it this way. When Jesus said, thou shalt, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if you look upon a woman in lust, you've done that already in your heart because it's a heart issue. That's why it's a tree issue with you. The fruit just tells you what tree's in there. The fruit just tells you what your heart is. Or when he said, you know, the law says thou shalt do no murder, but I say if you hate without a cause, you're murdering. Right? That's why, that's why I hate racism, like more than probably any sin, probably inordinately. Because in our culture today, it, it, it seems to be coming from all directions. I hate it. People are people. My dad told me, and he pounded into me. I'm so thankful for this one good thing. There's things he didn't tell me. I wish he would have. But he did, he did tell me, he said, a, a value of a man is not their social class or education, the amount of money they have. What they look like on the outside, their age, uh, and what country they come from, it, it doesn't matter the color of their skin. He says character. That's how you judge a man, by their character. By the tree. By the tree. That's how you judge it. And how do you judge that? By the fruits. Jesus said it. By the fruits. You know them. And in Matthew 7, and I got two main texts, Matthew 7 and Matthew 12, he's warning them about false prophets because these guys were snakes, right? And they were, they were into it for themselves, and there's false prophets all around today. You know, churches can grow big in number, but if you leave out the truth that offends, why not come? It makes me feel good, right? Why not? Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. In other words, a good heart will have good fruit. A bad heart, an unregenerate heart, a selfish heart will have bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's in the end. That's in the end when it's all done. If the heart doesn't change, the tree doesn't get cut down, you don't plant a new tree. If you're breathing today, you've not committed the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's work is to point to Jesus, and Jesus is the only one that can change your heart and make you brand new and make you born again. Are you with me? So if you're here and you're breathing, you think, well, maybe I, I'm too late for me. No. If you're here and you want to be in church, no. If you have that thought, no, you haven't. Okay? You got an opportunity of grace and mercy today. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. In other words, this stuff, this stuff of the heart, this stuff of the tree, this stuff of fruit, it matters because it has to do with eternity. You see, it is not theology that saves you. There are going to be a lot of people that won't be in heaven that their theology biblically was sound and right. But God, they never repented, their heart never changed, and they weren't a true follower of Christ. Are you with me? Are you here? And there's going to be people that, that their theology is a little messed up. They're a little whacked out. I mean, so they believe things that aren't even biblical. 
or whatever they were told this, but they did the right thing with Jesus because it's not your theology that saves you. While it is important, I'm not undermining it. Because it can lead, poor theology can lead a person to, to lose their faith and walk away because when they start measuring and going, well, if that's true, then this is true, and then you don't believe. But the point, Ben, is what did you do with Jesus? That's what it is. What did you do with Jesus? And Jesus is the one that saves. In Titus, it talks about people that their hearts aren't so good, or maybe their heart is good. Titus 1, 15 and 16, about the pure and the unpure. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. Let me stop and say, this is a shame that we parade sins all around and people are on television, in the movies, in the streets, in the open, um, on, on social media sites. We parade sins all over and no one is sh- ashamed. Like there's no shame. Like, oh my goodness, it just like... Nothing is shameful. Nothing makes, nothing makes us blush and go, oh. And that's, that's a sign of the heart. They claim to know God, verse 16, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. In other words, they claim to be a Jesus tree, but by their action or their fruit, you can tell they're not. God help us. Fruit, this is reference. It has to do with that tree, uh, what's coming out, what's in the heart. The tree's the heart. The fruit is what we, and our actions and our words. The second thing, the fruit of our lips is the word lips. In Hebrews 13, 15 again, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually. That is the fruit of our lips. Our lips. I see concert worship being shallow. It's very shallow, and people will clap because there's, there's a lot of energy in that. But lips are to give thanksgiving with, and I think we should clap and shout, but you ought to, when you clap, at least like this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I mean, if you're shy, you're not loud, fine, I don't care. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. At least speak something, right? God, you're good. I praise you. Hallelujah. It doesn't have to be loud. But you need to use your lips, you know? Do you agree with that? How about just say, thank you, Lord, just something. Yeah, don't have to be loud, just say it. Say, praise the Lord. Say, I don't like to be told what to say. (laughs) What's wrong with America? We don't cooperate. Come on. That's a stubborn heart right there. That's a rebellious heart. That's a heart of, you know, why can't we just do that? And say... You know, just like lift your hand, okay. Hallelujah. I'm the little guy on the emoji. Hallelujah. I, Hebrews 13, 15, the Hebrew writer is quoting Hosea, or he's referring to, this is out of Hosea 14, 1 and 2. And look what it says. He's encouraging the people to return to God. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Now look at this, words, the power of words. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all of our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Lips. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, the heart and the lips are tied together. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. The words and your heart are linked together. The tree is the heart, the fruit is your actions and your words. Pay attention to what you say. In Matthew 12, 33 to 37, here's, the, here's, the, here's one of the, this is basically the core of the message. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Let me read it this way, that verse 33. Make your heart good and your fruit will be good. Make a heart bad, your heart bad, its fruit will be bad. For a heart is recognized by its fruit. That's what it's saying. Now, Jesus being political as he was, 
He goes on in verse 34, and he says, you brood of vipers. That was supposed to be humorous. <laughs> Jesus wasn't very political, was he? You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? But you gotta understand he's not mean to people he disagrees with, that's not where he's coming from. These are the people that are pretending, he's, he's talking to the people that are religiously pretending that they represent God and they're, and they're trying to control everything. And, and if you know the history of who he's talking to here, they were lining their pockets. They weren't paying the, 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 the uh, rabbis out in the synagogues in this earlier area. They, they were the elite, they were the high, chief priests and the high priests and they were lining their pockets. So he's going, you guys are snakes is what you are. You brood of vipers. And he's speaking harsh to them. And he says, uh, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Do you see it right there? You brood of vipers, how can you eat or evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. He's going, you know, I don't know what you're saying here, but I know your heart. And, and then he says, a good thing, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the de- evil stored up in him. And here's the deal, what you take into your eyes and into your ears, like I said, in movies and music and what you read and conversation, everything is poured into your heart, to your inner being. The soul is mind, will, and emotion. You know, the mind is part of your heart, your emotion. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So your heart is not just feeling, it's thinking. And your thinking is influenced by what you read and what you talk about, what you look at. Everything comes in and it makes your heart either a good heart that produces good fruit or it makes it a heart that's rotting at the roots, that's not producing any fruit. And that would be uh, the best situation, but or producing really poor fruit. And you can tell by listening to what person says and by their actions. Lord help us, right? A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Verse 36, but I tell you, and when Jesus says, but I tell you, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth, that everyone will have to give account of the day of judgment. Now look at this. For every empty word they have spoken, I'm in trouble. You're in trouble. Every empty word spoken. But by your, by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. By your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be judged. Either one, acquitted or condemned. That, your words have that much power. They're words of life. Uh, how does God, every word you speak, remember all that? Depends on the size of your God. He's probably got angels assigned. Now, angels aren't that smart. They're created beings. They can't remember your whole life and every word you speak. They can't remember that. Well, maybe they can. I don't really know for sure, but in my imagination, they can't. The Bible doesn't say. But I know God, he knows the number of hair on your head. And for me, he's having to calculate that every day. (laughs) And he knows every one of you by name. He knows your every thought even your thoughts, not much less your words. And this God that I serve is so big that from the beginning of time, from Adam and Eve till now, he remembers everything everyone ever said, everything everyone in all different languages, over a billion people are saying, and everything in the future. And he, he is that big. He knows. And say, woo, we're in trouble. I mean, come on. If I was to bottle up your words and pull them out and play them for people you talked about and say, this is what they said here. Well, look what he said about that. He, I know that you, I said, boy, he sure is handsome and smart, that Pastor Weaver. And I, I, would, I wouldn't mind hearing those, those recordings from you. But God does talk about liars to be friars, so don't be lying about how handsome I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me the truth. <laughs> but honestly, he remembers every word. And so he's going to hold us accountable. He's that big of a God. And uh, I, I think this is a good thing, is that if you ask forgiveness, he says he throws your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. He chooses to not remember them against you anymore. My words, he chooses not to remember. He's not forgetful, God. But he chooses not to hold them against you anymore. 
That's what you call mercy and grace working together in tandem, both sides of the same coin. Mercy not judging you the way you deserve to be judged. That's what that means. And grace is giving you something you don't deserve. It's the power of God that comes and changes your heart. That's what grace is. Grace isn't a formula. Everybody can say, well, I have unmerited favor with God, undeserved. Yeah, the unmerited favor is he came to you. He showed you his truth. He showed you his love. He gave you his, his son. He suffered for you. He died for you. You didn't deserve it. And he comes into your heart now with power of his grace to save you and change your heart because that's what has to happen to every person. And people that are raised in the church that have never really repented and said, forgive my sins, take away my, my stubbornness and change my heart. Change my heart, God. Come in there and change it. They, they are religious people that have a belief that are just trying to somehow work their way to heaven. But when Jesus comes in and does a work, man, it is done, and it's done well. And we need the power of God in our religion. Uh, it was the late uh, uh, president of the, of the uh, Southern Baptist. He's dead now. A doctor, um, uh, you know I'm talking about, Pastor Jeff. But anyway, he used to say, if your religion doesn't change, who is it? Yeah, and... Uh, 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 who is it? Adrian Rogers. He's just say, thank you. Pastor Jeff's not as smart as you are. Oh, wait a minute. There. <laughs> You're brilliant, brother. I love you. He said, if your religion doesn't change you, you need to change your religion. It's powerless. So I conclude with this. It says in Proverbs 10, 31, from the mouth of the righteous, talking about lips, from the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be silenced. James 3, 10 and 11. We all know this one. We should anyway. Out of the mouth, the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So we just think it's no big deal because they didn't hear us. And we throw out these words. We'll say things about people. We'll run our mouth. We'll say, that person's an idiot because they, they work at McDonald's and it took them an extra two minutes to get your coffee. Or the way we talk to our spouse, you know. Most marriage problems are caused by words. Words matter. I've had people say right in front of me with their spouse there, yeah, he doesn't come to church much. He's not really into it like I am. What are you thinking? Don't say that. Be careful how you talk about your spouse because in words are life and death. You speak life into them. And so the response is Colossians 4, 6. This is encouragement to the church at Colossae. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. I love my food salted. The older I get, the more salt it takes. Let your conversation, look at that, your words be always full of grace, be gracious to people. People that are blind and ignorant, they don't know anything or they have a view that you go, that is so wrong. Don't be mean. Speak to them lovingly and kind. Be full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. So God's spirit will be involved in how you're talking with people. And then Psalm 19, 14, a long time prayer of mine. And this is the King James because I love the way it's worded. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Don't you want the words of your heart, look at the words and heart there again, connected. The words of my mouth, the meditation of heart, the trees, the heart, the words are the fruit. Let them be acceptable. You're my Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. And I love the Lord, but I haven't always acted like it. And some of you haven't either. And you know, words are used to repair a relationship. Your words to God, confessing Him and asking Him to forgive you and change you. Those words, asking Him to forgive you and all of that. And, and words in relationship to do good things, but also to repair relationships. Instead of holding on and, and not forgiving, to repair. Like, the, this, this, is, this is seven great words to, to help you in any relationship. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Say it. I was wrong. Make that louder. Some of you have never said that. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Here's not how to do it, okay? I need to ask your forgiveness. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Don't say that. I was wrong. Will you forgive me, please? Okay? Please. 
So I wonder today if it's going to be quiet in the foyer after this sermon. (laughs) Can I ask you a question? Have any of you ever said, if it weren't for the kids, I wouldn't be here? God knows your heart, doesn't he? When you close your eyes, and when the musicians come, let me just say this. Why do we say close your eyes? There's a couple reasons. One is you can connect with God and hear God. And people, with your eyes open, you can be distracted. You can tune in. Block everything else out because of what you look at will make you think something. Okay, so you guys on the front row, close your eyes. Put your phone away. Put your phone away. Close your eyes. And what I, what I want you to do is I, I want you to ask God what he has to say. Hear God, what does he have to say to you about what was spoken today? What do you need to do? Listen to God.